Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today about commercial and contractual stability in the world of esports. Um, esports is often referred to as the Wild West. Um, so I've got my buddy McCree up here who's going to show you how cowboy like that is. Look, I'll start story time. So the, the, the three stories I'm going to tell you about are teams, leagues, and brands. So who is familiar with esports, just so I understand the audience in the room? Yeah? Okay. Some hands not going up, so I'll just say it's competitive gaming spectated by masses with an uncertain result at the end of the match. Big titles are League of Legends, Fortnite, Dota 2, FIFA. Um, and as you can imagine, like in traditional sports, there are a, pl a, a plethora of contractual issues that arise between the various stakeholders in the industry. So why do people watch sport? We'll get into this when my real presentation is up later. But people watch sport because there is a huge audience to be commanded. And when you can command that audience, then brands want to market to them. So you have billboards, advertisements, sponsorship deals, influencer marketing deals, and what have you. Very same for esports. You know, so anecdotally, I walked into an investor's office. It wasn't Malta. And, uh, and he said, why the hell would anyone watch other people play video games? And I said, well, why does anybody watch somebody play rugby, because they are the best in their class. Um, and I would also contest that eSports provides this gateway to communicate with the fan that traditional sports does not provide. So it's very difficult to approach Ronaldo unless you invade the pitch. Um, whereas Ninja, you can literally tweet him. And he probably won't respond anymore. But maybe six months ago, two years ago, he would have done so. So what, 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 what was I talking about? I was talking about story time. So I'm going to tell you a story about a team. So in December the, of last year, 2018, I got contacted by a young mother who was playing Fortnite professionally. Um, and she had just signed a contract with a team called Evil Cake Army. Um, now, I was going to display the contract on the screen, but it is a one-page agreement that says, I will pay you $1,000 more. There's no reference to the previous term. It's signed by one of the parties. Um, and it's not dated. So it, it's not a contract, effectively. Um, and so what happened is my Twitter inbox got filled after being contacted by this one mother, uh, by the other members of the team, all saying that they wanted to sue the Evil Cake Army. Um, now I said, unfortunately, you don't have any judicial recourse because there's no contract in place. Story number two goes like this. There's a league called eChampions where at Sky Sports Studios, 16 of the best gamers were invited to play FIFA for uh, £10,000 prize money. The tournament organizers didn't know how to run an eSports tournament, so what happened? We had to sh close down at 1 AM, and none of the players have been paid. Story number three is Brand X wants to engage with Influencer Y through an agency Z. Now, the agency is located here in the United Kingdom. The brand is located in China, and the influencer is located in the United States. So what happens? I give the agency X amount to spend. The agency takes a little bit for themselves and pays the influencer. Now, in this instance, the influencer was supposed to do a video about a game called Rules of Survival, which is a, a product by NetEase. Now, he promised he would, promised he would, and when the money landed in his account, he then decided that he wasn't actually going to deliver this product. Now, here's the issue. All of these problems are being solved today with paper solutions that have a localized uh, execution format. What do I say? I mean, that contract is applicable. In, in, in the last instance, you have a Chinese company and a UK agency with an American influencer. The American influencer owes the UK agency who owe the Chinese brand. But which of those contracts are enforceable? So what I want to talk to you guys about today is a little bit of what we do at Edge to try and solve that sort of wild west of esports. This is a little bit of my backstory. Uh, I'm not going to get into it too much. I'm a sports lawyer. I then played 30,000 games of Hearthstone, um, became com competitive in that title, realized I wasn't as good as the other people, so started representing them. And I started seeing all of these problems. Prize, I didn't get paid my prize money. I didn't get paid my salary. I didn't get paid my sponsorship money. And that is an issue which is rife throughout the esports ecosystem. So what is esports? We've talked about this. That's League of Legends. As I said anecdotally, in accordance with my last presentation, you know, investors will ask, why do people go to Stadia and watch people play League of Legends? And the common retort is, well, why do people do this? You know? So drawing more upon sports, I want to talk about how this industry is regulated. Um, so we have leagues, and we have teams, and we have players. And we have the exact same thing in esports. 
And in between Arsenal and, and the Premier League, you'll have Slaughter and May drafting up contracts which, which indicate how the prize money at the end of the Premiership season and the broadcast money is going to be distributed. You have KPMG looking after their accounts. Arsenal will broadcast to Arsenal Television. There'll be fan-based platforms like Arsenal Fan TV. And then equally, they'll engage in sponsorship agreements with brands like Adidas. Thierry Henry is a player, and he'll do the same. He'll broadcast to his social channels, and he'll be sponsored by, by brands. And the same with the Premier League. They'll, they'll, they'll broadcast to you know, television, and they'll be sponsored by brands. Now, in between each of these entities, sponsor, brand, team, there are a multitude of people pushing around paper documents, signing, contracts, processing invoices. Research agencies will provide data on how much Thierry Henry ran last game, last match, last season. Uh, and then agents will try and broker transactions in between the two parties, and they will report back to the brands or the teams based on the performance of those agency relationships. So they'll say, oh yeah, the last influencer campaign that we ran for you, Arsenal, drove that much impressions, that, many, that, that much engagement, that much traffic. So we have the same thing happening here in esports, albeit with a slightly less robust and less well-defined um, regulatory system. So why is that? Because esports is brand new. Um, I'm not going to get too much into this now because I, I realize there's not a huge amount of time. Why this is all important um, is that esports is huge. Specifically, gaming is, is, is unbelievably massive. You heard Malta say before, it's bigger than music and, 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 and movies put together. Um, why is this equally important? Due to the size of the industry, w w we're in this unique paradigm where you have an industry which is growing faster than it can regulate itself. So some key questions that we, that we get out of this sports versus esports, how do we end the Wild West, what are the main issues are, what are the revenue streams, who provides contractual stability today, who does the invoices and payments, and who provides the data. So revenue streams, it's the same as sport. You know, you have sponsorship because of the eyeballs, you have broadcast rights, and then you have advertisement. T-shirts and, and jerseys and on match day tickets. I'd say what's missing here compared to the sports pie chart is, is, is the monetization of broadcast. So there aren't that many deals that are being done as of yet since esports has largely been free to air. Um, and I, I think that's going to increase. I don't know if anyone saw that the Overwatch League did a deal with Twitch to have the exclusive broadcast rights. And I think that's going to continue to happen more and more. Um, so in terms of the maintenance of contractual stability, as I said, here are the, here's the problem. We have localized paper solutions for a global digital world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific cases that uh, I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation and, and a, a little bit now. Is anyone familiar with this? Hands up if you know this. Nobody. Well, that's cool. Jess. Hi, Jess. Uh, hey, Warren. Um, that's a player called, uh, I believe it's uh, Turner Tenney uh, or Tfue. And this is his clan uh, phase. So FaZe are one of the premier esports organizations in the world. Now, these two have had a falling out in recent times. There was a, uh, one of the number one largest trending hashtags on Twitter in the United States last week was release the contract. So if you want to look at the two of these. Now, what, what happened was you have an American law firm that represent TFU and one that represent um, phase clan. So you have an adversarial legal system. So the two of those in entities have an, a vested interest in protecting the legal and commercial rights of their client. So what happens? They engage in a contract which is, for lack of a better word, terrible. Um, the, the agreement doesn't provide, uh, it, it, first of all, it says that phase are going to get paid 80% of the commercial earnings for deals that they bring to the athlete, uh, more than 50% of his streaming rights. And effectively, the problem is that that contract is engaged between the two parties at a time when they have no idea how well that relationship is going to go. So what does that mean? Nobody knew that Tfue was going to blow up and be the number two Fortnite player in the world. So FaZe Clan paid him an, a sum amount of money that was predetermined, negotiated by the two parties. But as he grew, of course, he got frustrated by the terms of that contract. And then what he said was, you know what, I'm going to set up my own team. And I think that's what you're going to see Tfue do in the next couple of weeks. He's going to set up his own team. Now, what would be better would be a digital solution to this esports industry. Let's imagine a situation where these two parties enter into a digital contract that scales based on the performance of the player. So how many views have you got on your social media in the last six months? 
six weeks, six days. Okay, well, let's pay you accordingly. So what you do is you get a smart contract to automate the contractual obligations and payments between the two parties. What does that mean? Right, okay, so the other additional advantage of using a non-paper solution for a digital economy is that you can circumvent legal disputes. So if we go back to here, it's quite obvious who's going to hear this dispute between the two parties. It's going to be the U.S. local courts. But what if he was a Korean citizen? who is playing for them as an influencer, streamer, even an esports professional, and he decides, I don't like this contract anymore, I'm going to tear it up, I'm not going to play. Well, what's their judicial recourse? They're going to sue him before the courts of the United States, he's never going to appear at trial, and they're never going to get their money. And that was the same as we had with the influencer in the UK agency and the, and the Chinese company. And it's the same as you're going to see, it's the same we had with e-champions. We had a Danish kid who was owed money, a Spanish kid who was owed money, and for lack of contract and lack of a, uh, of a judicial authority, they were not able to maintain the contractual stability. So I've put this up here. This is the Court of Arbitration for Sport. This is sort of a, a, a thought exercise. How do we end the Wild West of esports? Perhaps there needs to be a competent arbitration authority that can handle disputes like this. And indeed, what we would purport to do at EDGE would be build into the mandatory smart contracts that leagues and teams would use an arbitration clause, which effectively sends the two parties, everyone knows what arbitration is, yeah? It's not going to the national courts because they're really expensive and they're really slow. So you go to a highly skilled dispute body, and in this instance, it could even be digital. You could have a, a Skype courtroom, for example. Now we talk about payments and prize money. This is the problem again. We have localized paper solutions for a global digital world. So let's imagine you have the Fortnite prize fund, which is $100 million, and that's going to be distributed to all of the teams who are then going to distribute it, hopefully, to all of their players. Now the issue is accountants are processing invoices, and this is taking a huge amount of time. And what we're relying on is the trust and good faith of the bodies to those contracts to respect the terms therein. So what do I mean when I say all that legal jargon is you have a bunch of young gamers signing for a team, usually without reading the contract and in good faith, probably not getting paid what they deserve to be paid. That team enters into a tournament. They win the prize money. And often what we have now is a system of the fingers uh, of the fingers of the gamers being crossed, hoping they're going to get distributed their prize money. So again, what Edge will purport to do with its platform is have smart contracts automate the distribution of that prize money. So I was uh, really hoping Malta was going to be here because I, I don't know which investor sent this back to us, uh, but this was sort of some blind feedback. What it said, you know, if you ask most people what the, the thing that's holding esports back, I would venture to say that the lack of professionalism and not paying out what they contractually should. Indeed, a, ga a way to guarantee that entities are held reliable to paying out prize pools and delivering on player contracts is needed. So I wonder in the future if tournaments like eChampions, if EA would mandate that they use edge smart contracts and that the prize money is paid into a pool and then when tournament data that's pulled directly from the EA API is satisfied, then the prize money is automatically distributed to the gamers. That's our vision, is to end that Wild West. And I mentioned that term API, so I think that's key to all of this as well. Right now you have companies like Nielsen and Nuzu uh, even the eSports Observer are producing reports about data around the eSports economy and ecosystem. Now, that data is not being pulled directly from the source. It is being, there, there are admins who are looking at it. So what we would purport to do is integrate with the API of people like Twitter, Twitch, Riot Games, and, and, and Fortnite to collect performance data, but also social data. So a use case of this was Ninja. Everyone knows Ninja. I'm sure everyone knows Ninja. Right. So Ninja played Apex for reportedly $1 million for a week. Now, in that instance, there's obviously agency occurring between the two parties. So my question is, what's to stop Apex paying Ninja? I mean, it's not going to happen with Ninja because it's a huge amount of money. But we all have, if some of you worked for publishers, we've worked with micro streamers. You say, hey, I'll pay you 100 bucks to stream for this amount of time or to tweet with this particular tweet. And what happens now is the agent usually takes a cut of that, and then the agent will report back to you as a publisher of the brand what the performance of that cam campaign has been. What we would purport to do is say, okay, 
Apex, you can pay Ninja through our platform, and based on our observance of the Twitter API, we'll automate the payment of whatever currency you guys have agreed before the initiation of that campaign. So that's our way of trying to end the Wild West, to sort of demystify the numbers, but provide some contractual stability, and align the interests of the parties direct from the source and have transparency of terms. I'm not talking about disclosing the contractual terms to the community. I'm talking about disclosing the fulfillment of those contractual terms. This is a little bit of our platform. You can see there's a player, you know, a contract constructor. I'd like to take anyone through a demo if you're particularly interested. Um, but this is what Edge does. We're a smart contracts platform. We automate payments and obligations and ultimately circumvent legal disputes. Uh, I really liked what Malta said earlier about esports being an opportunity for platform tech to land and expand. It is a nascent industry right now. It is a blue ocean. It is totally the Wild West. Uh, and so our vision is to use our platform tech and expand into other markets, influencers, music, sports, and what have you. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're, we're just starting up. So the question was, what is the business model? Um, I, I, so it's a SaaS model, effectively. Now, and, and, and the reason why I'm saying that uh, is because... So here's the issue. For gamers, they don't have access to contractual services. So our platform will be free to gamers. So they'll have access to a template agreement so they can know what they're signing is valid and they're going to get paid their money at the end of the month in accordance with the terms of the contract. Um, we also have recognized that the model of paying a law firm to draft up a contract for you is quite expensive and it's, so you don't get residual value. So what we'll do is you pay us a monthly fee, a low fee, and we'll do all of your contracts, manage all of your payments. Uh, and if there's a brand deal, we take a percentage on the transaction. If I'm a and I want to offer this thing to my players, why should I? It's cheaper, it's more secure, and, and, and you're going to have a heck of a lot of hassle avoided. Uh, you, I mean, as a team, you want to have protection that your player is not able to go play for someone else, right? I've seen a player literally the day before a tournament say, I'm not playing for you, I'm going to play for them. Uh, so you want to have a legally binding document which would prohibit them from doing so. I think uh, one of the things for me is just whether you use this platform or, or build your own or whatever, it, this idea that you're building it into a smart contract where it, is, can, it can be tied into data, it can be automated, that kind of process, that mindset of, of making sure that the, what's going in is understood, what's coming out is understood, and that process happens. That I think we need regardless. I think it's an important part of what makes eSports tick. It's always been an issue, even back in the early days, trying to work out who pays what. It was easier when it was like a big sponsor, like a BT, running a small thing for a small event because we were entirely in control of end-to-end. -end. But as you've highlighted, I think, very clearly, this is becoming a big business now. In fact, it's becoming a global industry with so many different players. We have to have nice, simple, communicatable pipelines. Is that fair? I think that's a great summary. Thank you. I think, I think as well it's really important to make a point around statistics. You touched on kind of Nielsen and Exerto and effectively all these kind of big businesses that report about analysts and data. And you're kind of basing it on, like you say, the manual labour of people researching data. So to, to propose to build an API which pulls real-time data is an absolute game changer for anybody that's in the industry that wants to look at real statistics and real data. Because there's far too much embellishment and speculation on numbers now, right? Yes. Do you think that the software you've got is ready to rock and roll now? Or would there be a timeline that would kind of take you to that point where you'd sort of say, based on integration, it would take X amount of sort of time to, to get you there? Yeah, we're, we're doing our launch on the 4th of June. So on the 4th of June, a brand will be able to uh, interact with a gamer and say, OK, if you tweet that with this hashtag and it stays up there for at least two months, then we'll pay you this amount of money per impression, per engagement, per share, per view. You, you, know, you can set the metrics in the smart contract because ultimately every single brand wants something else. I, they want conversions for sure. They want you to click on the influencer post and go and buy something. But they also might just want brand awareness. They might want a, a viral video. It, it depends on the brand. Um, I can't remember if you said this or not, but is this a blockchain-backed process that you're using, or are you using a, a central server for that? 
Uh, it's blockchain back, so the, the database is stored on blockchain. But, but, I'm, but I think it's a really good thing. I mean, I'm a massive fan of blockchain personally, but for this particular process, because you have distributed parties, you need a trustless system. And I think people don't understand that whether you, what you think about Bitcoin or whatever else is irrelevant. Actually, distributed, non-trusted, sorry, trustless is a different, difficult thing to say, but hopefully you know what I mean. I, so how important do you think it is for people to understand why that process works? Uh, quite difficult, which is precisely why it's not in the presentation anywhere. <laughs> Sorry. Um, typically, if you mention blockchain and esports in the same sentence, you, the, the person's eyes roll over. Um, but you're, you're, you're dead right that having a trustless ecosystem where a player's identity is verified and the performance of their tournament results in-game performance is, is verified, and then you can see those terms executed by the smart contract, have they been observed or not? We're just trying to provide some stability to the ecosystem because I, in my experience, a poorly drafted contract has been the norm rather than the, the exception. I think this arbitration piece is actually hugely understated. I think, I think, I think I had not heard of the importance of it until this talk personally, but it makes so much sense. Um, do you think that's something that is widely understood, or do you think it's something, is it just I've missed it, or do you think there's a wider issue which we're not communicating, that this stuff is complicated and we need to fix it? Um, I think, well, there's a lot in there. I, well, I, look, I think things like TFU and Phase Clan will bring forward the, uh, the, the, un, the contractual uncertainty that exists right now in, in esports, and where is that going to be adjudicated before the United States courts? It's only a matter of time before another high-profile player is subject to a contractual agreement where he says, piss off, I'm not coming to the courts of Spain. I live in Sweden. You know, well, th that would be quite difficult, Sweden and Spain, but I'm specifically thinking of examples of Asian players. And I'm going to say thank you very much, and we'll, we're going to take a quick break.